Good morning. Welcome to our Bible class this morning. I'm glad you've joined me today. We're in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Some words have distinct meanings. One word meant something special to Reginald Heber. He spent his time at the University of Oxford as a teacher and a student. While there, he developed a poetic bent. In the cathedral that, was, that graced the campus, he witnessed light flowing through the stained glass windows, bouncing off the gold-gilded ceilings, creating just the sparkle like stars in daylight. It was like the angels were there. No wonder his creative juices began to flow, and he wrote these words, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, Early in the morning my song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, the tr blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. All the cherubim and seraphim are falling down before thee, which wert and art and evermore shall be. Now we recognize the words of that song, Holy, 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 because of the majesty that they contain. That repeated triad of holy drives home the point that God is different and distinct. But that is true also about God's church. It too is to be holy. It's a word that belongs in church. But what makes it that way? I think there are many answers, and many we've already touched on through our series of lessons in Ephesians. But in this lesson, I want to focus on a central idea that makes God's church unique and holy. The church seeks the wisdom to follow God's will, not man's. So let's dig into today's lesson and find out what makes the church God's church. Now, Paul begins again in this lesson, as he has, it seemed like, in the rest of in the last three or four, with the same refrain, using the same common word, to walk. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. He, plays, he pays close attention to your daily spiritual walk. It's the latest in the instructions on living in God's church. He's told the Ephesians many times about walking. Walk worthy of the calling, he says. Do not work, walk as the Gentiles walk. Walk in love. Walk as children of light. But now he adds another element to the Christian living in this passage. Walk as wise, not unwise. So what exactly is this wisdom and its reverse? Wisdom is the application of acquired knowledge. The smart person knows what to do. The wise person knows when to act and when to refrain. Melan Kundra has said that the stupidity of people comes from having an answer for everything, but the wisdom of the novel comes from having a question for everything. Not a bad way of thinking of wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to know what to do in the right circumstances, in the right way, and then acting on it. A wise man knows what is appropriate for the situation he finds himself in. He can run when running is required, but walk when walking is necessary. Wisdom says the right words to those grieving and keeps his comments to himself to prevent an argument. But what kind of wisdom does Paul counsel? Well, the first has to do with how we, how we use our lives. He says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Now, Paul's language is vivid. He goes to the agora or the Greek market in Ephesus. It's where you would go and you'd exchange your money for the goods that you need. And that's the term he uses for making the best use. It's buying from the market. Go out in the marketplace of the world and buy back your time because time is, is like money but only more precious. We can make all the money we want and even replace what we spent. But all men, from Jeff Bezos to the curbside beggar, are given 24 hours a day, and when it's gone, you don't save it or extend it. It is a gift with an expiration date. 
And this passage says you need to go out and you need to buy back or redeem that time for opportunities. He says, notice your opportunities. There is this, this term season in Greek, and it's one of two words to describe time. Chronos is one, and it measures hours, minutes, and seconds. It's, it's what we say when we say, what time is it? And we say, well, right now it's about 1225. That's what we mean. We, need, we mean chronos time, but the other is the one that Paul uses here, and that's kairos, and that's general time, an appropriate time. The tree has a time for dropping its leaves. It's appropriate to the moment. You can't set your clock by it. It just happens. It's when the right moment comes. It's when the season arrives. We plant in one season, harvest in another. That's the right time because that's when the opportunity presents itself. Paul says you need to take your opportunities seriously to serve God because the days are evil. Now, when you review the context, he observes that most people are using their lives to do evil things. He's already mentioned about immorality. He's already mentioned about coarse joking and jesting. But Christians order their lives for another purpose, the purpose of serving God rather than self. That's... They know how to use the falling sand in the hourglass for eternity rather than for today. And we all need to notice how we spend our lives. After all, the tomorrow we have is the today we use. We know wise people know that time is truly a gift and they know to invest it in the timeless, not the temporary because the wise man knows the value of time. Benjamin Franklin observed, Doth thou love life? Then waste not time, for as that is the stuff of life. But the second thing that Paul says is wise is to seek the will of God. In verse 17, Paul continues to detail wise living for the Christian. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, many people, they want to find the will of God for their lives. But they're looking for a very minute, specific will of God. They're looking for something different than what Paul was pointing to here. There are a lot of people, they want God to make every decision for them. I've known people who say, I'm looking for the will of God and what kind of cereal I'm supposed to eat in the morning. Or, what pants I'm supposed to wear today. Now, I kind of shake my head thinking, you really think God is going to be concerned with whether you eat Cheerios or Frosted Flakes? Or whether you wear blue pants or black pants? But see, they want God to make every decision for them. But Paul says you have to understand what the will of the Lord is. And when he says that word understand, he means use your reasoning power. That's, this is not a ref, that's, is not a reflection of spiritual maturity if you can't think through things to find out what God's will is. Wisdom seeks the big pieces of life and puts them all together. God has given us a grand gift, and it's the gift of the mind. He expects us to use it. He expects us to, to exercise it for His good. Now, we gain all the knowledge from God's Word, and that's good, but how do you make sense of it? That's wisdom. That's understanding. That's the reasoning that you put together and say, we need to know how we live the will of God. And we are curious creatures who seek comfort in the familiar. And tragically, most don't want to understand the will of God. Instead, they want to be told what they already want to do. Many want sermons and classes to confirm their prejudices, and there are plenty out there who will do that. They want comfort over conformity or satisfaction over security. So, can we read the Bible and look at it with open minds to think through it, to determine what God wants for the church and for us. And remember, God's plan is more extensive than my own individual beliefs and desires. It is the mystery of, cha of changing the barriers that religion has built. So what is the will of God? 
How do we understand it? How do we reason for it? We keep reading, we find an answer to that question, both in today's lesson and next week's. Because in verse 18, Paul presents another contrast. He's been presenting contrast readily through these passages. Here he does again. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now before we dismiss this too quickly, we need to travel back to Ephesus. Paul is presenting a class of cultures. He has for the last two chapters. We've already seen it in this section of Ephesians, and he, when he contrasts immorality with faith, and now he tackles another ever-present challenge for the Ephesians as they live in their city. One of the more famous Greek gods, or at least more popular ones, was Dionysus. He was a god of wine and fermentation, and Greeks would indulge in Bacchanalian festivals named after the Roman equivalent to Dionysus, Bacchus, and they would drink fermented drinks, usually wine, until they were just completely drunk. There was a reason for that. <clears throat> you know, if you can dress bad habits, if you can dress vices up in religious dress, it seems to soften the blow. And that's what happened here. They believed that if they drank to the point where they could almost pass out from the stupor, that Dionysus would now control their life, and therefore they were giving control of their life over to this God. Now I think that's pretty apparent today, because drunkenness relaxes the urges and takes away our control. And for the Ephesians, it was the literal form of under the influence. I knew a young man in class when I was in college. He was a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy. He was highly intelligent, quite savvy. I was very impressed with him. He had this interesting job. He was a pilot. He would take twice a week a B-52 bomber and fly around Alaska for two hours under the, under the bomb bays of his plane were enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world twice over. And he circled every other day waiting for the launch codes to come that would annihilate the planet. Now, if it did come, and thankfully it didn't, he would return to the Air Force Base in Abilene. But I remember, I don't know how this all came up in this class, but we started talking about alcohol and drinking. And because he was not from a church background, he was taking psychology classes as part of a master's program, he, he freely admitted that he drank on a regular basis. And I was kind of intrigued by that, because I, and I wanted to ask him a simple question. Why do you drink? His answer was, it, said, it loosens up my personality. I'm more fun when I'm drinking. In other words... He wanted to be under the influence because he became a different person under the influence. Now the question that Paul floats in this verse is fundamental. Who controls your life? Is it going to be the spirits you drink or the Spirit of God? The truth be told, all of us are under the influence of something. The only question is, under whose influence? And that changes your perspective. So what does a church under the influence of the Holy Spirit look like? And it's nothing like the modern charismatic version of falling on the floor and spouting gibberish in the form of what is called the Holy Spirit language. Paul knows exactly, because he tells us what it is. The first thing is, it's a singing church. First, the the church, filled with the Spirit, sings. In verse 19, he says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. For those of us in churches of Christ, that's become a bone of contention. Does this verse exclude the use of instruments in worship, or does it allow them? I've known people who've held both positions and used this same verse to prove their point. And it matters little, though, what your personal opinion is. And it matters little what mine is, for that matter. What does matter is what this verse really does teach about 
a church that is filled with the Spirit and sings. But first, let's dispel something. Something I, I have heard people say that's not true, it's not accurate. I've heard people say, the Bible says that you cannot use an instrument in worship. I hate to tell you this, but there is not a commandment anywhere in all of Scripture that says, Thou shalt not use an instrument in worship. Now, I wish there was. It would make this a whole lot easier. This lesson and a lot of the approaches thing would be so much simpler if God gave us this, this detailed list of all the do's and don'ts of Christian living. But He doesn't. But I think the second part of that is, but does the absence of an absolute command give us the license to do as we please? Notice how quiet the Bible is about other things, that we don't seem to have any problem creating a fence to go around. It doesn't say anything about using cocaine, does it? Nothing says you can't. Does that mean you can what about driving above the speed limit? There's not a verse that says, Thou shalt not exceed the speed limit. Or what about this? Thou shalt not spit in the face of another person. It's not there either. Does that mean you can go ahead and go down the street and just create all kinds of furor? Now, I think it's easy for us to say, Well, that's just silly. But that's because we've resolved it easily in our own minds. We know what to do because we apply a principle in a passage, in a way that restricts certain behaviors. That's how we thought. We've reasoned it out in the absence of a basic command. The absence, we know, does not necessarily give permission to do as you please. If this verse was not in the text, I am pretty convinced that we would be free to do as we would want to do, because it has nothing to say. But there are constraints built into this passage that helps us define what they did and how we do it too. So in this context, we must test the view we have, which is something a lot of people don't want to do. They, they are quite settled. They want to cut and dry it up or down. This is what I believe. Now you tell me why I'm right. Most of us want to say, I'm right, you're wrong. And I know what I believe and I don't want to be unsettled. But let me tell you one quick thing. A belief that is not tested is not Bible. It's prejudice. If you're not willing to examine what you believe about this or anything else, you don't really believe it. So let's test it, for I trust that it can stand the exam examination. What kind of singing is in indicated here? First, the passage says this kind of music is, for the lack of a better term, oral togetherness. Remember, he says addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We speak to one another. The voice is employed in a way that we are together and we speak to the needs of each other. And one of the interesting findings of current research is how potent it is when people come together to sing together. It's just absolutely amazing to me that somehow it takes the 21st century for, for smart researchers to catch up with what God has already said. When you sing together, it's an interesting thing, they say, it changes your heart and puts you in one mind. There is a unity that happens when you sing together. Isn't it interesting that God says you need to speak to one another? We know that singing does. What happens, though, if you add an instrument? Some say it makes absolutely no difference at all, but I beg to differ because I've got my evidence is, is some pretty simple observation. I had a good friend who was a preacher in the conservative Christian church in the town where I previously served. And since we shared a whole lot of things in common, and we do, except for the use of the instrument in worship, Fred and I loved each other and had complete respect for each other. We would visit from time to time, have coffee from time to time. We'd talk about all kinds of things. 
I, I'd send my children to their VBS every year because they could be around their friends and they used the same material we did. Same publishing house, same material. And on closing night, though, they always had a program and they supposedly had a time of singing, but it was always with a piano. So I went to one of these and I took the opportunity to watch. And I looked around. I was paying attention. I was testing the thesis. And no one was singing. They didn't know how. As long as that piano was playing, they just didn't sing. They just let the play piano take care of it. They listened to the piano and the song leader and it became a perfect duet that they all watched. So later Fred and I were visiting and he said, well, we still sing. I said, are you sure? He said, now Fred, before you answer, I've been to your church and I don't see any mouths moving when that piano is going. And it was good hearted. We weren't fighting with each other, but we were sharpening each other. Finally, finally, he reluctantly agreed that the piano kind of shut down the singing. And anything that takes away the together we sing with our mouth cuts against the grain of this verse. It just is. Because this is oral togetherness. I think the second consideration of this passage is the meaning of the Greek word solo. Now that may not mean anything to you, but let me translate it. In this passage, it's translated making melody. And that's all that it says. But what does that mean? See, you can, you can drive a Mack truck through that if you need to. It's only used two, time, two other times in the New Testament. And both are translated by singing. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15, it says, What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit. I'll pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit. And I will sing with my mind also. And then in James chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Now, I'm going to tell you, that doesn't help resolve the issue very much. Because people will say it just says sing. It doesn't say sing without. And we would point out it doesn't say sing with either. And that's our problem. But see, the term literally means to pluck. Now, it can mean to pluck a string like a guitar string, but it can also mean to pluck a hair, such as one that's ingrown. So how do you know what's being plucked? That's a word that demands a direct object to specify what is being plucked. In our lesson today, we see what that is. There is a direct object here that describes the instrument that's being used. We make melody with the heart. The specified instrument is the human heart, the instrument that God made, that, God, that He crafted. Spiritual worship is about spiritual things, not spiritual things combined with man-made items. Paul doesn't add anything else, so it seems to be excluded. But is that accurate? See, I'm willing to say it may not be, so you've got to ask the question. Is it accurate? Or have we twisted something to make it say what it doesn't say? Everett Ferguson was one of my church history teachers when I was in college, in graduate school. He's well known in Christian circles, not just in churches of Christ, but broadly in Christian circles for his knowledge of, of ancient church history. He tells a story that he was getting his doctorate and he was attending Harvard University, not exactly the bastion of faithfulness, and while he was there, he roomed with another student who happened to be Greek Orthodox. So one day, Ferguson asked his roommate if it was accurate that the Greek Orthodox Church did not use instruments in their worship. And his friend confirmed that that was true. And so Ferguson asked him why. And here's what the response of that man was. We do not use instrumental music because it's not in the New Testament and is contrary to Christian worship. Now understand, this is from a native Greek who understand the Greek language far better than any of us on this side of the Atlantic understand it, which begs the question, how did the church really sing? Now, perhaps we've read something in or out of this text. It can happen. 
I've seen it happen. I've even done it. So it's essential to come to some sort of conclusion that is both reasonable and scriptural. But remember, the church grew up in an environment. That's one of the things that Ephesians points out, that, there is, that the Ephesians are, are in this middle of hotbed Gentile worship. And it's also got Jews in it who go back to Abraham. But both the Jews and the Greeks used instruments in their worship and their rites. The Jews had a lyre as part of the temple worship, and the Greek mystery religions relied heavily on harps and lyres. So it would be natural just to adopt what they had always done. Did they? Well, the only way to know is to look through their picture album, which is their history. We can know so much about the church by looking at what was being done in the second century because their practice came from the origins before. And so they only did what was taught to them by those in the first century. Now that's not inspired, but it is illuminating. And when we do, we find a deafening silence about the instrument. In fact, the very first mention of it in church history comes in the 6th century after Christ when it was kept in a closet and used only in weddings. But even that raised a great debate. It was not something that was happening regularly and was just absolutely accepted. accepted. Instead, it was, it was a contention item. You don't do that. In fact, it was a thousand years after Christ before it became a standard practice in worship, which was by then the Roman Catholic Church, a far cry from the simple pattern of the New Testament. In fact, the term for singing without a musical accompaniment is the term a cappella, which means in the manner of the church. How did the church sing without an instrument? It was a cappella. But another factor comes out of the book of Ephesians itself. And that has to do with the context of culture. For two chapters, Paul has contrasted the church with the culture around it. He's emphasized that the church is different from the climate that is surrounding it. The moral practices of the church were distinct from the world around it. Immorality, coarse joking, tolerance for sin were out of place, his words, in the church. That even includes the religious climate. Now that that principle will lead us to reject instruments of worship because it reflects the religious culture we find ourselves in, not the pure church Paul was describing in the Ephesian letter. When we adopt cultural standards, we are adopting culture. Paul was definite not to adopt culture, but to adopt Scripture. And you have to ask yourself, why? Well, I think there's a final issue. Again, this is a personal point that came that, that for me because it was something I have experienced. It came from a distinct moment in my life. One year, my family and some friends attended the annual Bible Teachers Workshop at Abilene Christian University. We had for many years. It was kind of our summer respite. And at night, they would always have a lecture at which before they would sing some songs. But one night, on a Monday night, something just absolutely terrible happened. A tornado spun up and struck the electrical trans transmission station that ran the campus. And so everything went black. The power was out in Moody Coliseum, leaving it darker than the darkest cave. And so we decided we were going to wait for the power to come back on so we could resume it. But it never did. But something happened that I don't think I'll ever forget. We sang. 
We sang first verses of songs we all knew, that we had sung in church all of our lives. I don't know how many songs we sang, but we sang dozens of gospel songs in the pitch black of night. Now I reflect on that night today, and here's what I see. God's simple plan for worship allows us to worship, regardless of circumstances, or of culture, or of condition. See, we could not have done that that night had we had to have an instrument. What's going to happen? Singing, pure singing, without the assistance of anything else, could make worship a reality, whether you're in the African bush, the Amazon jungle, or a glass cathedral in New York City. Man could not do that, but God could. But let me make a couple of observations about all of this. First is a stark reality. The culture changes the church more than the church changes the culture. Since the end of the apostolic age, that's the way the church was organized, led, worshipped, resembled more of the culture around them than the plan of God in the beginning. It is the pressure that constantly pushes the church in a different direction. And we, ca and we caught a glimpse of the grasp of culture as we've, le as we've looked. And we have to ask, are we caught in the grasp of culture or the grasp of the Spirit? One more item. People ask this question. Well, is that going to send me to hell? I don't know, because I'm not in that position to judge. That's way beyond my pay grade. However, it's the wrong question. Have we given ourselves permission to do as we please in the dress of God doesn't care? See, see there's nowhere in Scripture that says you need to ask the question, is this going to send me to hell? It does ask the question, is this going to be the will of God? And if you remember in this passage that the pursuit is not on what we can get away with, and remain Christian. Instead, it's what it says in verse 17. Understand what the will of the Lord is. See, we need to pursue the will of God. We need to humble, be humble enough and obedient enough to conform to His will, not to our own, and certainly not to the religious world around us. Do people use an instrument because it's in the text? or because it allows us to fit in with the religious world that we live in. And if it's the latter, how can we say that it is the will of God unless we are self-deceived? But this lesson ends with one more mark of a church under the influence of the Spirit. It will continue in the next chapter. But today, the last one is, it's a thankful church. Listen to how Paul closes this lesson. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church sees the blessing of all things. This kind of gratitude sees God's hands in everything, even in the worst of times. John Chrysostom, the great preacher of a church of a latter day, had a curious thought that Christians could give thanks even for hell because hell was warning them to stay the right way. I think it saddens me to see so much of the backbiting and the attitude of discord in the church today over things like political issues. Instead of finding differences and problems, we ought to be seeing blessings. We ought to be thankful, not fighting. And a church that's led by the Spirit doesn't argue, but it blesses. It doesn't complain, but it thanks. Does that describe us? Paul has said we should walk as wise, not as unwise. And while that sounds easy, it's not. Instead, it forces us to think to a higher level and pursue a different path in this world, even the religious world around us. We don't live as others do, but the church lives in the Spirit of God. 
So what does the church and the Spirit do? Well, we've seen the answer. The wise man seeks the will of God over his home. The unwise seeks his own will over God's will. And tragically, too many of those who call themselves Christians have succumbed to the human inventions of, and prevalent ideas of, brought by men. Those ideas from good books rather than God's Word bring us foolish living that pursues human goals, not God's great will. So the question we have to ask ourselves constantly is, do we seek the will of God over our own will? That will determine whether we are wise or not. Thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure being with you again. I hope that you've enjoyed our lesson and got something out of it. And until next week, I wish you to have a good day, and I'll see you again next Sunday.